my life to you. I can shout from the inside out. Welcome to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Molter of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today. Sit tight, get your Bible, and get ready to get in the Word with us as we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book through the Word of God. Well, if you have your Bible, let's turn to Exodus chapter 7. Continue our study through the book of Exodus. The title of our study is Hard Hearts and Deception. And if you're new to Calvary Chapel, we want to welcome you. What we do is we teach through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. Um, just as you'd read a magazine or any other book at home or even an article or an email, you start at the beginning and you read it all the way through in context. Right? You don't take the first verse out of the first paragraph and then you go to the middle and you go to the end. You wouldn't have the complete story. Uh, and yet, sadly, so many people do that with the Bible um, so we want to read it in context. We want to understand what God's Word says and what God is saying to us so we can apply it correctly. Because um, unfortunately, uh, that's what happens when you kind of do a cookie-cutter approach to God's Word. You can make it say whatever you want it to say. In fact, that's, that's what the devil did, right? He tempted Jesus with Scripture. Um, the Scripture says this. Well, if you read it in context, in fact, I think it was Psalm 91, the next verse talks about the serpent being crushed. But... He left that part out because he didn't want Jesus to remember that, apparently. So, uh, so context is important. And so that's why we read through the Bible. We want you to be equipped with God's word, uh, to know his word. So Exodus chapter 7 is where we're going to be. And um, as I was thinking about this chapter and um, the deliverance that God's going to bring to uh, his people... I was reminded that we often like things done in a hurry. I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm a little impatient, I will admit that. And I'm sure the Israelites were just like us. Um, they wanted to go to the promised land and they wanted to go now, right? If that's what God has promised, let's go. But um, we don't see that happening. But God could have delivered them after this recent meeting between them and uh, with Moses and Aaron and Pharaoh. God could have said, okay, it's time to go, let's go. But God has another plan. He's going to bring ten plagues or judgments upon Egypt first. And I mention this because we want oftentimes our plan to happen now. Right? God, here's what I have in store, what I'm thinking about. And if you could execute this this way, that would be great. And God goes, well, I have my own plan. It's maybe similar to what your plan is, but my plan is better. And I'm going to get all the glory for it. You just have to wait and trust me. And sometimes we have, we have issue with that. But God's plan is always the best plan we could choose to follow. And so today we're going to see that God begins to show the Egyptians and Pharaoh his power. And God will also give them an opportunity to repent. God's a gracious God. He's not willing any perish, but all come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us that. And so uh, the Egyptians will have these ten judgments that come upon them. And every time God's given them another opportunity to repent. Um, and so we'll see that uh, as we continue through the book of Exodus together. So hopefully you've made your way there, Exodus chapter 7. Let's take a look at the first seven verses here together. So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron your brother shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not heed you, so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch up my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Then Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded them, so they did. And Moses was 80 years old, and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. We'll pause there. 
So God says that he's going to be making Moses as God to Pharaoh, which is interesting because you remember Pharaoh is like the God in Egypt, right? And he's a legend in his own mind, you could say. And I kind of see this as God's sense of humor um, that Moses is going to be as a God in the eyes of Pharaoh. Uh, that's the mighty work that God is going to do. And God's going to get the glory. And so I see this as God has a sense of humor in demonstrating his power and showing who the real God is um, in Egypt. And God's going to get all the glory. Now we also see here in verse 3, God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And we saw this back in chapter 4 in the book of Exodus, that God uh, did not harden Pharaoh's heart against his own desire but rather God confirmed or strengthened Pharaoh in his decision. And I mention this because if we don't understand a little bit of the Hebrew language, we could come into some real difficulty here in understanding the way that God works and, and the way of God. And, and we might begin to wonder, well, is God fair? I mean, to harden someone's heart and then you bop them on the head because their heart is hard? That doesn't seem fair, Right? But again, there's two different Hebrew words that are employed. Uh, it's important you know that because the, the word here in verse 3 literally means to make stiff or to strengthen the heart of Pharaoh. Where the other Hebrew word means harden in the sense that we think of. So Pharaoh hardened his heart and God strengthened Pharaoh in that decision that he had already made. Strengthened him in that position. Now Pharaoh had free will to begin with. He had the choice to choose uh, to let the children of Israel go or not. Um, and he exercised that choice and hardened his heart against God. And then God firmed up that decision. And Pharaoh revealed his heart when he refused the humble request of Moses back in Exodus chapter 5 to let them go three days uh, and worship the Lord. But it's tragic that Pharaoh hardened his heart. And, and personally, I think Pharaoh is one of the most foolish people in all of history. Uh, very selfish. Um, he allowed Egypt, spoiler alert, he allows Egypt to be wiped out because of his own wishes. The strong position he takes against God and against the people of God. But God knew that Pharaoh wasn't going to let them go. Uh, and this is what we call foreknowledge. God being God knows the beginning from the end. He is outside of time. He knows what we're going to do before we even know it. And, you know, if we knew the future like God, man, we would, we would have done things differently. Probably more God's way than our way, right? We would have been seeking, Lord, what do you want me to do in this situation? More than, well, I got this one, Lord. I can move forward and I'll just ask you to bless it. Um, it doesn't work out so well when you try and do it in the flesh and not in the spirit. So God deals from this advantage of foreknowledge. And it would be very foolish for God to have this foreknowledge and not utilize it. Right? So God uses his foreknowledge wisely. For me, this is another strong reminder why it's important to listen to God. He knows what's going to happen. He knows the beginning from the end. He tells us he's preparing a place for us. He's going to come back and take us to be with him. We're not sure when that is. could happen today. That'd be awesome. I'm ready for the rapture. I think we all are. But we know that it's going to happen. When is it going to happen? We don't know. But we know he's preparing a place for us in heaven, that he's going to take us away to be with him forever. And so we know that God's word is true. We can trust what he says. It's reliable. We can take it to the bank. And so it's wise to listen to the word of God. And in Hebrews, it tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it's important that we not only read the word, but we hear God's word. And I remember a brother years ago saying, man, I would really love to hear God speak to me. And I said, do you mean like that still small voice? He says, no, like that loud, audible voice. And I said, well, in Hebrews 11, it talks about faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Brother, you need to just read the word of God out loud. He's like, what do you mean? I said, well, when you read God's word out loud, you're hearing God speak. Right? Not, it's not God speaking through your voice, but you're hearing his word. And it's interesting because there's something about that. When you're reading, uh, whether a book or uh, anything out loud, you retain that information so much more 
than when you read it silently. And so I would encourage you um, in your reading time, try reading out loud uh, and see if that encourages your faith even more. So we want to listen to God who is the all-wise one. Now also at this point we're told that Moses is 80 years old and Aaron is 83 years old. And this is when they begin their ministry of leadership that God has for them. I love that this is here in the text because for me it's this reminder that you're never too young and you're never too old to be used by the Lord. To be in the ministry of the service of our Lord. I know there are some groups that discourage kids from helping and you've seen my little ones are helping around and um, sometimes bossing me around. Um, and, and, and so you're, you're never too young, you're, but you're never too old to be used by the Lord either. Uh, I mean, Moses is 80, Aaron is 83. So you're, you're not too advanced in years to be used by the Lord. And, and the truth is, as Christians, we're all called to ministry, just different forms of that ministry, uh, different calls upon our life as we live out that ministry. So I don't know if you've heard this before, but if you're a Christian, I want to say welcome to the ministry. You're in the ministry. You're a minister unto the Lord. You may not think of yourself that way, but you're a minister. Um, and and you're, you're serving the Lord. And I believe in our fellowship, we have many of us who are ministering in, in different ways. Uh, ministering in the workplace, ministering at home with children and in foster care. Ministering to those in the community, uh, ministering to extended family members, ministry to neighbors, and more. Uh, there's a ministry that God has for each of us. I can't reach your neighbors. I can't reach your coworkers. But God can use you to do that. And God's called each of us to the ministry, to, to reach those around us with the truth of the gospel and the hope that we have in Jesus. Now, I do need to also warn you, though, the devil will tell you over and over again that you're too old or you're too young to be in service of the Lord. And he'll also come and begin to whisper for you to doubt your ability, doubt your capacity, and doubt your skills. But let me tell you, God's not looking at your ability. He's looking at your availability. God's concerned with, are you willing? Do you want him to be used in your life? If so, as you see, and they say, the prophets, here I am, Lord, send me. God says, I can use a person like that because they're humble and they're willing to be used. That's what God is looking at. And so while you're breathing, you're still capable of serving the Lord. And I've heard beautiful testimonies of people, even in the hospital, they're still breathing and they're witnessing to the doctors and to the nurses, to extended family that are still struggling with, is there a God and does he love me? And their face is just radiating with joy and peace, and they're telling people about Jesus. And I think, man, they're doing more ministry right now than I ever could. It's awesome. And so while you're still breathing, you can do ministry for the Lord. Again, we like to compartmentalize what that is, but ministry is whatever we do as unto the Lord. And so don't discredit yourself. You could be eight or 108 and serve the Lord. And as you serve the Lord, he, he sees that your work is unto him. He, and he loves that. He loves that you're, you're reaching those around you for him. That you're loving on those around you for him. And God sees that and he will reward you. In fact, I believe one of the first things we'll hear when we get to heaven is, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And so we're serving the Lord. We're serving him, and he will reward us one day. So Moses and Aaron, well, they're advanced in years. That's a nice way of saying they're old. Um, 80 and 83. And yet, they're just getting started. There's a whole lot more of the book of Exodus that we're going to see. God has a lot more in store for them. And so, again, I just want to encourage you, where you're at with the Lord, don't give up. There's a whole lot more God has in store for you. A whole lot more ministry he has planned for your life. Uh, and so you want to make sure you're, you're in tune with God and what he has for you. So we see Pharaoh of Egypt and his foolish heart. Next we'll take a look at some miracles and signs and uh, some swindlers and some snakes. 
We'll see that here in verse 8 through verse 13. So Exodus chapter 7, picking up in verse 8. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Show a miracle for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your rod and cast it, cast it before Pharaoh, and let it become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went in to Pharaoh, and they did so, just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh also called the wise men, the sorcerers. So the magicians of Egypt, they also did like manner with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods, and Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. We'll pause there. Now, I, I need to answer this question. Maybe you have this. What is a miracle? Maybe you've heard this phrase used so many times that you've kind of lost the concept. And I hear it all the time, right? When our team finally wins the game or there's that awesome catch, we say, man, that was a miracle. But was it really biblically a miracle? No. A miracle is like when Jesus could walk on water, when he could turn the, the water into wine, where he could feed thousands and thousands of people, where Jesus could raise someone from the dead and raise himself from the dead, where Jesus could heal people, where Jesus can forgive us and change our heart and we become born again. That's a miracle. Uh, it's something that science and reasoning can't logically explain apart from God. It's supernatural. And, and if you don't believe me, I wouldn't challenge you next time uh, when the ice uh, melts, try walking on water, right? We kind of have that joke that I can walk on water when it's frozen, but um, try it like Jesus, right? <laughs> when there's no ice. You won't, you're not going to get far. Uh, we'll go right through. Uh, but God can do that. And so a miracle is something that we can't fully explain by science or reason. We can't explain it apart from God. And here in Exodus, we see these sorcerers, the magicians, enchanters. They, in a sense, duplicate this miracle. They turn this rod or wooden staff into a snake. And it's interesting, some of the movies show that uh, there's this puff of smoke, this little cloud that appears, and they're... So their staff is hollow inside, and the snake comes out at the bottom, and ta-da, look what we did. And they hide their staff behind them or put it on, you know, the ro on the back wall or something. And um, I don't know if that's, that's the case. Um, we're not exactly sure how they did it, but we know they're imposters and that their snakes get eaten by the staff of Moses. So there you go. They lose that battle anyways. Um, it's also interesting they're not named for us here in Exodus, but two of these men are actually named for us in the New Testament. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, uh, the Egyptian magicians who oppose Moses, their name is Janus and Jambres. Again, these are not real miracles. I believe they're not parlor tricks. I believe it's the power of Satan, um, the power of darkness and not the power of God. And I need to mention this because as, as 2 Timothy 3 talks about this, we need to be aware there are counterfeits. Counterfeits do exist. There are counterfeits out there. And if you watch so-called Christian TV long enough, you'll find out some of them. Um, they want your money, right? Um, and I've always wondered about that. You know, when they say, hey, brother, we need your money, and God's going to bless you back. And you give us, you know, 10 bucks, and he's going to bless you tenfold, and you're going to have that cash coming to you. And I think, if you really believe that, you should be sending me your cash. Because then God's going to give you that cash back, right? But of course, that's the way they scam people. Um, and, and it's all a deception. And that's right. That's right. So there's, there's counterfeits out there. Everyone wants money these days, right? Um, they want the free handout, you could say. So there's, there's power in those, but it's the darkness. It's the power of darkness. 
And I say it's because some people are so amazed that they see something spiritually happen and they think, it must be a sign of the Lord. And, and when we were in California, we weren't far from Redding, California, which is where Bethel was, and there were some weird things taking place there about some supposed gold dust, angel dust falling from the ceiling and in the Bibles and, um, and all this weird hokey pokey kind of stuff. Um, I remember one of the videos, the guy, uh, the youth pastor there showed that they had pennies that were stuck to the wall and it was a sign of God's presence. And, um, and of course, the way you get a penny stuck to the wall is you rub it enough and it creates enough heat and friction. It can stand right on the wall, you know, but after a while it eventually falls. I'm thinking, this is all fake. It's all, it's all to attract people to something. It's a gimmick. It's not attracting people to Jesus. Because at the end of the day, the, these signs aren't going to save people. It's the deliverer that's going to save people. Um, it, it's God that's going to save people. And so we have to be aware that there's counterfeits. And there's demonic sources instead of godly sources. And so if some psychic or new age power uh, comes into your life and things kind of seem right, like somehow they know certain things, don't be seduced by it. There are demonic powers, and we have to be on guard. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 15 tells us that even the devil comes masquerading as an angel of light. So we have to be on guard. In fact, that's, uh, most of the cults have started this way. As some angel of light comes to them and tells them, there's another gospel. And it's like, have you not read the book of Galatians? Paul says, whoa, you know, cursed be that preach any other gospel. Even if an angel comes preaching some other gospel, let him be accursed. So we have the gospel, we have the true Jesus, and we do not want to be deceived. Again, I mention this because the Bible says in the last days, it says men will resist the truth and be deceived by the power of darkness. Uh, it's written to Timothy about this, Peter writes about this, Paul writes about this. Uh, even in the book of Revelation, John writes about this. In the end times, there's going to be a power of darkness and there's going to be deception. And I think today we, we have similar imposters. Moses and Aaron saying these people are trying to deceive people. And the deceiving spirit of these last days is not stronger than the power of Jesus. The glorious truth is we don't have to be bound by the spirit of our times. We don't have to follow the world and its blindness. And again, maybe uh, this is my soapbox, I don't know, but um, you've probably seen recently where the CDC came out and said that, you know, common sense is no longer wearing one mask, right? It's wearing two masks now because that makes sense. Why not three? Why not four? Why not just wear the whole box? Amen. I don't know. I mean, is that common sense? <laughs> What's actually interesting is if you read the back of the box, it actually says it, it's not going to prevent coronavirus. Um, and so that's probably where they... Uh, we're saying, you know, if it's viral, it can come into your body through your eyes. Maybe you need to start wearing goggles. I don't know. Apparently, this is all common sense. But it comes down to whose interpretation, right, of science will people follow? And how far are people willing to be led? There's this deception that's taking place. That somehow this little piece of cloth is going to protect you. I mean, I go, uh, like we were up in Fargo the other day at, at Costco, and I'm seeing people not washing their hands. And I'm thinking, I'm probably more concerned about that. Because you're touching the carts, you're touching the door handle, and you're touching things on the shelf, and you're putting it back. And I'm thinking, you know, that we should be a little more concerned about that, right, than the other stuff. But anyways, the Bible says there's coming a day in the future where deception will be at an all-time high. So much so that people be willing to take a mark on their right hand or their forehead to buy and sell. I don't believe that day is here yet, but it's not far off. There will come a day where people go, well, I like that convenience. I already use my smartphone. I don't have to have a wallet and just give this little tattoo on my hand or my forehead. I'm good to go, you know, and don't have to worry about it. It's, it's all free money anyways, right? That's the way that, that this world is heading. And so these people are thinking they're doing this to survive, and yet their deception, they're deceived. They've just sealed their eternal fate, which is separation from God. And so 
I'm thankful that here at Calvary Chapel, we are among the remnant of believers that know the truth. We know the Bible. We know there's victory in Jesus Christ. We don't have to be blind like the world and be deceived. I'm thankful that we're a church ready for the rapture. We're ready for the return of the Lord to take us home. And that we know the truth that we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And we're going to be with him forever and ever. And, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us this. It actually says that we're to encourage one another with this truth. And I mention this because uh, there's this growing debate today about uh, that Christians are going to go through the tribulation of God. And again, if that's what we're supposed to encourage one another with, I don't find that encouraging. I would be more encouraged if God takes us out before that happens. That's what I find encouraging, and that's what I believe. Um, God took Noah and his family into the boat before judgment fell. God took um, uh, his people out of Sodom, right? Took Lot out of Sodom before judgment fell. And God's going to take his bride, his church, out of this world before his judgment falls. Man's judgment and man's persecution will happen, but not God's persecution. He will take his church out before that takes place. So we see that there are miracles, there are signs, but there's swindlers out there. Be on guard. There are deceivers. Uh, They're not concerned about your salvation. They're concerned about profit in their pocket. You could say they're they're not a non-profit. They're a for-profit profit, if you get what I mean. So be on guard against those swindlers, those snake uh, slithering uh, people uh, who are trying to deceive people away from God. Well, in this last section, verse 14 through verse 35, we'll see that uh, the first plague happens, and we'll see the waters become blood. So continuing our study here in uh, Exodus chapter 7, we pick up in verse 14. So the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning when he goes out to the water, and he shall stand by the river's bank to meet him. And the rod which was turned to a serpent you shall take in your hand. And you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you, saying, Let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But indeed, until now, you would not hear. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the waters which are in the river with the rod that is in my hand, and they shall be turned to blood. And the fish that are in the river shall die, the river shall stink, And the Egyptians will loathe to drink the water of the river. Verse 19. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your rod and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their streams, over their rivers, over their ponds, over all the pools of water, that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout the land of Egypt, both in buckets of wood and pitchers of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded. So he lifted up the rod and struck the waters that were in the river, and the sight of Pharaoh, and the sight of his servants. And all the waters were in the river were turned to blood. The fish that were in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink the water of the river. So there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Verse 22, Then the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments. And Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh turned and went into his house, neither was his heart moved by this. So all the Egyptians dug around the the river for water to drink, because they could not drink the water of the river. And seven days passed after the Lord had struck the river. We see in this last section the mercy of God in even bringing this judgment that he he allowed them to still get some form of water as this plague took place for about a week's time here. Now you see these um, so-called wise men, these magicians, and, and maybe it's just me, but I think if these guys were really wise, the greater miracle would have been in turn the 
the river back from blood into pure water. That would have been the, the awesome miracle, right? Um, but I think these guys are just kind of dumb, to be honest. Um, they're kind of adding to the plagues now. Like, look, we can turn it into blood too. Great. That, that helps. How? We have less water to drink now. Um, and so these imposters didn't help. They only made the matter worse. It would have been better if they had not further polluted any of the water systems. Now, there's a book out there. It's called Worlds in Collision. It was written by Emmanuel Velosky. And in it, he tries to explain away the awesomeness of God. He gives an explanation that the waters turned to blood because there was a near approach to the planet Venus. Nonsense. Others have suggested there's natural causes, that there was an algae bloom, what's known as red tide. And that happens in the eastern part of the world today, and sometimes we see that happens even in America today, that there's algae that takes place and lakes and rivers will turn red. But they do not turn to blood. And it's interesting, there are some books out there with a lot of conjecture in it today. Uh, there's liberal seminaries that try and explain away all the miracles of the Bible. Um, I believe the description of this plague here truly is a supernatural event. In fact, we see it took place immediately and in multiple areas according to verse 19. Um, it was just something supernatural. So an, an algae bloom or a poured chemical would not have affected the whole water supply. It wouldn't affect the cisterns, the rain barrels, and everything else. And also this biblical account of this plague in Exodus suggests that the water was turned to actual blood. The fish died. It stank. And, uh, and so it was physical blood. I prefer just to believe the Bible, that it was miraculous. It was a miracle. I have no problem with God working a miracle. Um, the fact that he would save me is a miracle. The fact that he saved us is a miracle. The fact that he can do anything else, it's not hard for me to comprehend that he can do a miracle. God can do many things. Jesus can turn water to wine. How hard is it to turn water to blood? So I don't need to help God out with my own concepts of what God can and can't do because he's great enough. He can do anything. He can do these signs. It's not, it's not too hard for him. It's also interesting that for many of these Egyptians, they saw their Nile River as a god. In fact, they had a few gods for this source of water. They uh, had a god known as the guardian of the river's source. They had another god for the spirit of the Nile. And they had another god. They said the Nile was the bloodstream of this other god. So these false gods of Egypt lost. They're not helping. They're not doing anything. And the Lord Almighty wins as he always does. He is the real God. And the Nile River was their, their basis of daily life, the national economy of Egypt. And the people were devastated. They had no water. But again, God showed mercy. And they had to dig for water, something they had never done before. And God was merciful and, and yet willing to give them an opportunity to repent, to come to realize that there is a true and living God. It's not Pharaoh and it's not these false gods of the Nile River. As we continue going through the book of Exodus, we'll see God continues to bring judgment upon these false gods in Egypt. But it also reminds me in closing that Jesus said in John chapter 7, verse 37, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And then John 4:14, 4, Whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Friends, there are many in the world today searching for something real. Their souls are thirsty. They are longing for something that is real and genuine that can help, that can change their life. The good news is that God can satisfy that deepest longing of thirst in our human hearts. God is the solution. And we can point people to Jesus, who is the one that will give us that water that wells up to eternal life. And God can be our deliverer and bring us into that freedom. And so I hope that we would be a part of God's plan to help quench those thirsty souls around us.
And then as believers of Jesus Christ, Lord, would fill our cups to overflow to those around us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, the example of Moses and Aaron. We thank you, Lord, that um, you had a mighty ministry in store for them at age 80 and 83. They're just getting started. Lord, Lord, we ask that you'd help us not to discredit ourselves from the ministry. That would realize that no matter what we do, as we're doing it unto you, it's ministry. Help us to do a good job in, in serving you and, and living our life in a response to your love. That we would just simply walk in those good works you've prepared advance for us to walk in. We ask God that you'd help us to be a light in the darkness around us. That our light would shine brighter and brighter as the world gets darker and darker. Help us, Lord, to know your word, to know your truth so that we would not be deceived. And that we could be equipped to help those we see we love being deceived. To reach them with the truth of your word and your gospel. And God, we do ask, we do pray, if there be any here this morning or watching online or listening to this message later on, who don't know you as their Lord and Savior, we ask God that today would be the day of salvation, that they would surrender their life to you and put their faith and trust in you. If that's you and you'd say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me, I need to get right with God. I need to surrender my life to him. I simply want to lead you in a prayer and encourage you to make that decision where you make that commitment to put your faith in God. And if that's you, I simply want to encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and mean it in your heart. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I realize that my sin separates me from you. And God, I also realize you love me. You love me so much. That Jesus, you died on the cross for me. That you died for my sins. That you shed your life's blood to pay for my sins. That you were buried and rose from the grave. God, I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and my life today. Be my Savior and my Lord. God, I thank you for loving me. I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you for showing me your truth. Empower me from this day forward by the power of your Spirit to follow after you. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Look, if that's you and that was the first time you prayed to receive Jesus Christ or rededication, let me know. I'd love to just encourage you, give you a Bible if you don't have one. You've been listening to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Molter of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today as we study God's Word cover to cover, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. Would you like to partner with us? Consider becoming a giver with us to support this ministry. Please visit ccfergusfalls.com slash giving. Find out more about this ministry and all of our ministries. Check out ccfergusfalls.com. May God bless you as you study his word with us and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Life to you I give shout from the inside